The dark clouds over the global economy are also dampening the outlook for the shipping industry. Hong Kong, one of the busiest ports in the entire world, is losing some competitive edge and is facing tough rivals. Join us this weekend as CCTV speaks with Sabrina Chow, chairman of Wakong Maritime Transport Holdings. She shares her views on the shipping outlook and her experience at the helm of a family business. Only on Biz Talk. Hong Kong, one of the world's leading financial centers and one of the busiest shipping hubs. The former British colony is a city of endless opportunities. Get on board as I speak to Sabrina Chow, chairman of Hua Kuang Maritime Transport Holdings, one of the oldest and most prominent shipping dynasties in Hong Kong. At 38, she is listed as one of Asia's most powerful businesswomen, according to Forbes, and the youngest in the ranking. But dark clouds have gathered over the shipping industry. Due to the global economic downturn, companies like hers are facing stormy headwinds. We talk about the outlook for the shipping industry, Hong Kong's family conglomerate, as well as how it feels to be a top female executive in the male-dominated maritime industry. Port strike in Hong Kong. The world's third largest port after Shanghai and Singapore suffering a blow as workers strike to demand higher wages. The dispute, which has dragged on for much of April, has caused port delays of up to 60 hours and is costing Hong Kong's port operator over half a million U.S. dollars a day, according to local media. The biggest story is the whole Pearl River Delta, including Shenzhen, Hong Kong and Guangzhou, is actually seeing the export grow slowing. The Pearl River Delta ports saw their first big spike in transshipments in 2003, during China's early WTO days. Shipping volumes bounced back after the 2008 global financial crisis, but have since leveled off to what Leung describes as, quote, slow grinding growth. The other Delta ports of Shenzhen and Guangzhou compete with Hong Kong for volumes. Naturally, it's cheaper to ship goods directly to mainland customers via Shenzhen. But because of its reputation for efficiency and security, foreign companies often prefer to go through Hong Kong. After the handover, a lot of people thought that a lot of Hong Kong shipping business would uh, migrate to cheaper ports in mainland China. Hong Kong would become less important. In fact, it's competed very well. As price competition intensifies, Mark Conan of CCAM thinks shipping margins will shrink. And as China focuses less on exports as a growth driver, the sector, he says, will need to reassess its strategy. The shipping companies are certainly feeling the heat of that potential price war. But there's a sense that as China focuses more on domestic consumption uh, and ch shifts gears within the economy, that it will start consuming more and sucking in more imports. And I think Hong Kong is well positioned for that. And with workers demanding higher wages, Hong Kong's competitive advantage may be weakened further. Sabrina Chow, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me, Martina. While Kuang is uh, focused on a fleet of LPG carriers, tankers, as well as bulk carriers, mm -hmm. and uh, they are chartered to shipping companies and charters around the world. Now, what is your business outlook for this year? Where do you want to set your priorities? The business outlook this year is definitely um, to continue in the three sectors that we're in. Um, the, the current business environment is not the best for shipping. Um, with the tanker market and the bulk carrier market, actually, it's in a very, very bad depression. However, the LPG market is still very buoyant. So being in three sectors actually naturally hedge our risks by being exposed to different markets. So that serves us very well. So we have to, um, for this year, we still have to balance out, you know, the, the three sectors for us. So definitely to continue to look for business opportunities, to cost control, and then to manage risks. Bulk carriers, uh, they are a key focus uh, for your business. Um, they are chartered to companies for the transport of raw materials and minerals, such as coal, grain, or uh, other products. Now, what kind of uh, business uh, outlook do you see for this market? The bulk carrier market is in a very bad recession right now. And the outlook for the market will 
probably remain bad this year. Um, but having said that, in a bad market, we better ships get built because suddenly the shipyards all listen to what the ship owners want. So that's one plus for, for the environment, for the market, for the consumer in the long haul. Um, but in the short haul, it means that there will be a lot of casualty. There will s probably still be more company going bust this year. And, but that is the natural way of, of business cycle anyway. And how are you avoiding to go bust? What kind of emergency plans do you have in place? Well, we have a very prudent business model and we learn from our past experiences. Um, to develop into the current business model that we have. So although the bulk carrier market is in such a bad state, um, we are still profitable and we have a very healthy balance sheet and very healthy cash flow. So we will just, we'll be in a very lucky position to um, take advantage of the low asset price to reinvest back into the sector. Talking about uh, the economy of Hong Kong as well, the uh, index of economic freedom, which uh, is a barometer for economies in the world, has uh, since its inception in 1995 named Hong Kong as the freest economy in the world. And it takes into account uh, various uh, sectors such as property, the stock markets, uh, mm -hmm. as well as uh, transport, logistics, etc. What are some of the advantages of doing business in Hong Kong and what are maybe some of the uh, downside risks as well? There are many, many factors that contribute to why Hong Kong is such an ideal place of doing business. Of course, we have a very low tax regime. Um, we have, the, the, you know, it is very easy to move capital around in Hong Kong. We don't have tax on that. So there's a freedom of movement there. We have a very hardworking and educated workforce. People are constantly going back to school to learn to do a diploma, to do courses. And I think that is very important. And then, of course, you have, we have a very sound legal and uh, sound legal system and, and regulatory environment, which is ideal for, for international business to, to flourish here. So, um, okay, downside risks. Because of the changing political climate in Hong Kong, um, in a way we are slower to, to adapt to changes, which could one day affect Hong Kong, because Hong Kong's advantage has always been we are very quick to adapt, we are very efficient. And when we lose that edge, that's when people catch up. And also you have countries like Singapore, um, which has been very aggressive to attract um, companies to, to invest in Singapore to provide, you know, sweeteners for them to come and all that, which, of course, as Hong Kong, we don't need to give out that because naturally we have an advantage, but we have to be very careful not to lose the edge that we have. Especially some of your major clients uh, in the uh, commodities business. Um, They're all in Singapore now. Exactly. Yes. How can you lure some more of them uh, to come to Hong Kong? Uh, do you think that is possible or Will they stay based in Singapore for the time being? You know, Hong Kong is still very much a ship owner's um, center. You know, we have a lot of owners um, setting up our headquarters in Hong Kong. And that naturally will attract all the service industry to come in because you want to be where your principal is. That's just natural. Whereas, like, you know, Singapore, they managed to get the commodities to come in and then you have the financial houses to set up the commodity desk over there because that's where the business is. That's where a lot of the shipping operators are now setting up their office there and then the ship brokers are going down to Singapore. It's all a chain effect. And Singapore has the foresight to see that. And Hong Kong, 30 years ago, we naturally have the advantage, but then we are losing it because we are not reacting fast enough. We are not seeing what will make Hong Kong an even better environment. Li Sheng has been working as a ship broker in Shanghai for more than a decade and has witnessed the rapid growth of the city's shipping industry. As far as I know, in the past, there weren't that many maritime lawyers or shipping brokers. 
But for the past few years, about 80% of the country's maritime lawyers and brokers are in Shanghai. From an infrastructure standpoint, Li says Shanghai already has what it takes to become an international shipping center. Shanghai is home to the biggest shipyard in the entire country, the Shanghai Waigaochao Shipyard. The port of Shanghai, with 32 million 20-foot equivalent units of container throughput in 2012, has been the largest container port in the world for three consecutive years. So now, it's all a matter of shipping service industries. An important indicator for a shipping center is the amount of activity and related services in the area. Are there many shipping companies, brokers and traders and maritime lawyers? And is there robust participation in the market from all of these? Shipping-related services in Shanghai have grown despite the global slump in the industry. However, experts say challenges still remain, for example, in terms of financial openness. Shipping finance involves account clearance, which depends on the free flow of capital. The reason Hong Kong is a shipping and financial center is because capital can flow more easily. For Shanghai to do the same, it needs the combined effort of multiple departments as well as favorable government policies. Shen says in order to catch up with Hong Kong, Shanghai still needs a more accommodating environment for international companies here, making more provision for investment and financing in foreign currencies. Other industry analysts point out that Shanghai has an edge over Hong Kong in some ways, too. Finance needs to be backed up by the real economy. Of course, Hong Kong is a developed shipping center, but Shanghai and its surrounding areas have a much stronger manufacturing sector. Both Qi and Shen agree that as Shanghai's financial services become increasingly more open, the city will be closer and closer to its 2020 shipping goal. Many oil tanker owners are also struggling because of the very high freight rates and uh, low incomes. Now there is a uh, study by the uh, trade association uh, Intertanko which says that 60% of all VLCCs trading on the spot market have accumulated losses of around 5.5 trillion US dollars in the period since uh, 2000. And nine, but uh, despite the slump, a lot of ship owners are still able to uh, chartering their ships out. How does it look like for Hua Kong? Are you still in a lucky position to charter some of your ships? We are coming back to the very prudent business model. Um, our, our tankers are all um, chartered on a five year time charter, which means that they are on a fixed rate for a five year period. Um, so because of that, our plankers are, s are still being employed <coughs> and yielding a decent margin. So it's serving us very well. And in any case, the, the spot market, um, playing in the spot market is just not, not our company policy because the, the tanker market can create huge volatility. And that's why we, we do the, the fixed long-term charter because that basically um, deal with the volatility in the market. Um, we, are capit we are ship owners, we are asset owners, so we are not looking to profit from the spike and the drop in, 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 in the market. That is, that is not our business. So we do the very steady um, time charter to, to flatten out the volatility. And then, of course, you have to understand that our fleet, we have 28 ships right now, it's very modern. The average age of our ship is under five years old. So um, customers are always attracted to younger tonnage because they're more efficient and, um, and they save money on, on fuel consumption. There are the many, you know, they're more environmentally friendly. So there are many good reasons why customers come to us. And then of course we maintain our ships to the highest standards to make sure that nobody has any excuse not to have our ships. In China, Qingdao and Salian ports are two of the major ones. What do your expansion plans there look like? Um, we have opened, recently opened um, a crew retraining center in Qingdao. So we will utilize um, the people coming from Maritime University um, to take them on board our ships for training and hopefully we'll develop a, a pool of seafarers that uh, will prov uh, provide a continuity of um, 
people serving on our ships and then one day coming on shore into our company to work. So to, that is one way to ensure the succession of managers within my company. So that, that is one, one big project that we're very, very excited about. Um, it is still in its infancy, but um, it is something to be very happy about. And we will probably yield the return, the, the, yield the results um, in five, at least five years down the road. So that is one project. And then in Dalian, um, Dalian Shipyard is um, one of our partners. We have built many ships there. Um, having said that, um, we would very much like to go back to building ships because the last ship built in Dalian was delivered to us last year. So hopefully we'll continue more business relationship with shipyards, but not just in Dalian, actually in Shanghai and all around sort of um, the Yangtze area as well. The dry bulk factor has been in a deep depression, as you've mentioned, uh, for many years now. And industry experts don't expect uh, any pickup or any major new ship deliveries uh, this year. What uh, kind of uh, measures uh, and steps uh, should ship owners uh, and uh, other major forces in the shipping industry take to help boost uh, the dry bulk sector? Um, actually, unfortunately, there is not much that can be done um, except to ride out the cycle. I think what you mentioned is absolutely correct. Um, the, we are in the worst recession in history in the bike dry bulk sector, and the delivery of ships coming um, into the market has substantially reduced. But that is actually a good thing. Um, because it means that we are take, we, we are um, con the, the supply of new ships coming in is being controlled, and then also with the high scrapping level, some of the old ships are leaving the world fleet. So that also reduces the supply of vessels. Because you have to understand where, why we are in the the, the recession that we're in, is because there are an oversupply of ships in the market. So until that problem is solved the dry bulk sector will not improve. Actually, on the demand side, surprisingly, it, it is very steady. There is, not, there is no sudden drop in demand um, in, in, in the market. So it is really a, a question of oversupply. So as I said, we just have to paint it out. Wah Kuang has had plans to uh, increase your current fleet of vessels. Now, that I think especially at shipyards in China, but also Japan, how many bulk carriers and tankers do you have currently under construction? Actually, um, our current order book is coming to an end. We have been taking delivery of many ships um, in the last few years. So we only have one more ship left um, to be delivered from China in Shanghai um, this summer. And that will end the current order book. However, because of the current environment we are in, there are many good deals out there. And it is very, very likely that we will embark on a new round of ordering in the future. And how are we going to pick um, where to order will very much depend on the specifications on ships design offered to us. And then we will communicate with our customers on what kind of ships, what are their requirements. And then we work together with the shipyard to come up with a ship that will um, satisfy the needs of our customers that we are confident in running. So it is a collaboration of effort between the shipyards ourselves and the customers. Wakong Maritime Transport Holdings was established by Sabrina Chow's grandfather, T.Y. Chow, in 1952. Over the past decades, it has grown into one of Hong Kong's biggest privately held ship-owning companies. The globalization and expansion of world trade, which took place following the end of the Second World War, offered many opportunities to shipping companies, particularly in the Japanese market. Wakong was at the forefront of this trend. In the mid-1960s, T.Y. Chow's eldest son, Frank, and youngest son, George, joined the company. Frank retired in 1999, and George continued at the helm. In 2002, his daughter Sabrina joined as the third generation of the Chow family into the business. In early 2013, Sabrina assumed the role of chairman with her father George becoming president. Today, 
Wacom owns a large fleet of bulk carriers, tankers, and LPG carriers, which are employed to charterers around the world for the transportation of commodities and raw materials. Tim Huxley has been CEO of the company since 2007. He says working for the family business is a unique experience. It's a fascinating position for uh, a foreigner to be in, working for one of the most well-established uh, Chinese family shipping companies. Uh, there are an enormous number of advantages of a family company that uh, longevity, while Pong's been around for 60 years, uh, the values that the company has, uh, the fact that they can take a much longer term view, uh, they're not so reliant on just quarterly uh, results to reply to shareholders. So there's a huge number of advantages in, uh, in being a private family company. This year, American business magazine Forbes puts Sabrina Chow on the list of Asia's 50 most powerful businesswomen. The heiress, at the age of 38, is the youngest amongst this exclusive circle. Other powerful women from China in the list include Sun Yafang, chairman of Huawei Technologies, Yang Mianmian, president of Hire Group, and Zhang Qin, CEO of Soho China. But still, women remain underrepresented in boardrooms across the Asia Pacific. In Japan, for example, only about 1.5% of board members at top companies are women. For Sabrina, empowering women is the key to success for Asian business. Now, a lot of uh, young women in this part of the world, in Asia, are aspiring to a position where you are. What kind of career advice would you give them? I think one of the advice I'm going to get give to um, female professionals, executives, um, wannabes, it's, uh, is to um, find your motivation force, find the driving force um, for you to succeed in your career. And the reason I say that is, you know, everybody is um, driven by different incentives. You know, um, some people are money, power, title, um, but less, some, some are less obvious. You know, for, for me personally, um, I'm very much driven by by my family, you know, the, the driving force behind me going to work every day and working in Hua Kuang is because of my love for my father and for my family. And after that realization, it helps you overcome obstacles and difficulties along the way because we all get disillusioned with, um, with life or with work from time to time and you need to always go back to the motivation. Why am I doing this job? Why do I believe in what I'm doing? And you need to hold on tight, especially for a female because as women, you know, we want to be a boss, we want to be a wife, we want to be a mother. And in order to balance all these out, you need to understand what is driving you forward. You're probably also the youngest chairwoman in the uh, global shipping industry. What kind of hurdles have you encountered as a uh, top female executive in uh, the shipping business? And, and also, I think in any industry that you know, you're surrounded by a lot of male colleagues, um, the way to push forward in your career, it's not so much you have to prove that I'm better than the men. You know, that is not a game that's worth fighting for. You know, you always play to your strengths. Um, so what you want to do is you want to um, shine in what you're good at and then you get the right people to come in for what you're not good at. And I think that's why I work so well with my CEO, Mr. Tim Huxley, um, because he is playing to his strength. You know, he's commercially very strong, he's operationally very strong, whereas I'm financially strong. And, and then, of course, it is family business, so I bring in sort of like the strategic development and management um, to the company. So together we congeal and work as a team. And then, of course, when people see the results that we deliver together, and then the respect and the recognition will come. So it is not so much a gender fight, but I think you always play to your strength. Now, as uh, the third generation of the uh, Chow family, obviously you also have to balance somehow the uh, family commitment with a modern management system. How are you achieving that? I think what you're saying is absolutely right. It is very important to balance the two, so family interests and um, business interests. And the way I do this is, first of all, you have to define um, what the interests are and then aligned the two interests together because 
um, you can one cannot overpower the next um, the the other and um, with the right governance in place you know you can achieve that balance and the reason I say that why both are important is because um, family interests family you don't think just think one quarter family you think long term you think generation after generation after generation and so the family interest the family mentality makes the company plan for the long term we can have the long term plan in place we just don't think about next year the profit the year after the profit we think 10 years later the profit so but the but the business interest which is the management style brings in the professionalism and then brings in the discipline that is required to take the company forward in a modern environment so you have to balance the two how would you describe the uh, corporate environment in Hong Kong for a woman at the moment? Do you think the uh, salary gap between men and women is shrinking or still widening? Um, Hong Kong is a very international uh, business uh, center, so I would like to imagine that the gap, uh, the, the income gap between male and female is at par with our Western peers. Um, we may be a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of our location, Asia, but I don't see us um, being disadvantaged because we're female. Yeah, I think the base salary, there's pretty much no disparity. And there are a lot of uh, family conglomerates, obviously, in Hong Kong, such as the Chung Kong Company of billionaire uh, Li Ka Sheng or Sun Hong Kai properties of Thomas and Raymond Kwok. What is your view on these uh, family conglomerates and do you think that uh, some of them need to adapt to a more modern structure and might be a little bit outdated? And it is in a way a conglomerate is, is a natural way of diversifying your business risk be, by being in so many different sectors and in many cases by being in so many different sectors it sort of creates synergy for your business as well. So, you know, there are many advantages to being a conglomerate. Um, at the same time, there are, of course, some downside, as you say, you know, there are, there are some dangers, you know, if you don't adapt. As, as a bigger company, it is always slower to adapt to changes because you're just more bureaucratic and then, you know, the reporting line becomes so, so large. But I think in, in the modern days, in today's business world, there are many solutions for that. You know, you have, you know, um, consultants who can help you to pr to improve your con your efficiency. Technology, you know, is is another factor. Um, but I think most importantly for any business, especially conglomerates, to 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 succeed, would be down to the people. It's all about human capital, human human resources capital, um, because you cannot do everything yourself and you have to rely on people who can make the shrewd business decision that needs to be made when it should be made and and I think companies that you have cited as examples are some of the top leaders in, 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 in Hong Kong because they are so good at utilizing people.